From heaven you came, helpless babe Entered our world, your glory veiled Not to be served, but to serve in your presence, remembering those decisive days in the history of the world so many years ago. We remember the upper room and the meal shared, our Lord taking the place of the servant and washing his disciples' feet. We remember the walk out into the darkness to Gethsemane and the long watches of the night when our Lord sweated and toiled, his soul deeply troubled, how he submitted to your will. We remember the shouts of the soldiers 
and his betrayal into the hands of his accusers, his arrest, his mock trial, abandoned by his friends, the crown of thorns pressed down upon his head, and then led out to die upon a lonely hill. We do not feel worthy of the price he paid for us, of the love he showed for us, of the love you showed for us. But we believe it was for us he died and suffered there. We come to worship and to marvel at the depths of the love you showed for us, at the barriers broken down that we might come cleansed into your presence, not through our own good deeds, but because you have paid the penalty for our sins. We thank you that you stand with us and bear our griefs and carried our sorrows. Forgive us our sins and set us free to worship you. For we ask this in your precious name. Amen. Why did you ever call me? I was happy at my work of fisherman, but you called me away. So you are Simon. You will be Peter, you explained. From now on, it is men you will catch. I never asked to come, but once you'd called. That's the thing about you. You seem to give a man a choice. But what choice is there really once he's seen? Had we but stayed in Galilee? Oh, it was so good those days with you in Galilee. The people loved you there. Now there you had a kingdom, and the sun was shining all the time. I suppose that wasn't so, but that is how I remember it, especially standing here in this unearthly gloom. Why is it so dark, Lord? It's as though the hatred of all the world has gathered here and is laid upon your shoulders. Look at the priests and Sadducees. They are the ones who have put you there. They've always been against you, Lord, from the very first. Why couldn't they see? I suppose you challenged them. They saw you as a threat to their position on authority. But what have they done, what have they ever done to help the sick and poor and give them hope and self-respect? You healed so many, brought them so much good, and they have now destroyed it all. Do you wonder that I'm angry, Lord? So very angry, Lord, with them. Last night it all began so happily. We were to celebrate the Passover with you. But somehow everything went wrong. There was that confrontation you had with Judas. You dipped that bread and offered it to him, then told him, What you are about to do, do quickly. And he went. He went to betray you, Lord. I didn't know it then, but you did, Lord. That's the part I do not understand. You knew, you knew it all along. I do not understand why, if you knew, you let him do it. But I'm angry, so very angry, Lord, with him. And then there was that row we had. Well, it wasn't really a row, but we got pretty heated, didn't we? Which one of us was greatest? How could we do that, Lord, when you had just before washed all our feet? Thinking of that now and watching you hang there is agony. I feel so terribly ashamed. And then you turned to me. You picked me out. Simon, you said, and it's just occurred to me. Why didn't you call me Peter then? Was it because you could not trust me to be the rock after all? Simon, Satan has desired to sift you all as sweet, but I have prayed for you. I replied, this is what I said, the actual words. Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. That's laughable now, isn't it? That's laughable. But you persisted. This very night before the cock crows, you will disown me three times. You knew. You knew that too. I do not understand you. I really don't. 
Why, if you knew these things, did you not act to stop them happening? But I will never learn, will I? I still blundered on. Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Not once. Not once. Three times, just as you had said. The third time, even as I was speaking, the cock crowed. You turned and looked at me. I was too far away for you to have heard what I had said. And yet you knew. Never have you looked at me like that. What was it that I saw? Not anger. At first I thought it was dismay. Sadness that I had dealt with you like that. But it was pity, not for yourself, but me. Ah, uh, now I see the truth why I am angry. You have never compromised, never once fallen from what you set out to be. But I, I have failed myself and you. I see now what I am, what I have always been, although I did not know. But you knew, didn't you? All along you knew. Yet you trusted me, befriended me, and I have let you down, denied I ever knew you. I want to say that I am sorry, to ask you to forgive me, and I think you would. I want to restore the relationship we've had from that first day that Andrew brought me to you. But now I never can. You die believing that I do not care, and I must live, knowing I do, but unable to say, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry that at the end I failed to be what in my heart I longed to be, one you could rely on. I must live with my failure. But, Lord, now that I see it, I am not sure that I can. With your death, every hope I have is extinguished. Were you there?
Was it for this? Was it all for this? When first the angel came and said I was to have a child, a boy, and he was to be called Son of the Most High, he also said you would be great and sit on David's throne, and your kingdom would never end. What sort of throne is this? Your hands so torn and bleeding. I remember you would lie upon my lap, and I would take those hands in each of mine and gently clap them both together. You would laugh and, gurgling with delight, stretch out and touch my face. Such kind and gentle hands you have, my son, and strong. But now, stretched out again, they cannot touch those nails. Was it for this, my son, my son? Was it all for this? If this is all, why did the shepherds come that night in Bethlehem and bow their knees, and following them the magi with their gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh? The gold is gone. The frankincense we could have used to anoint your body for the grave. And myrrh, could they have known the soldiers here would offer you a drink of vinegar laced with myrrh to ease your pain? Where is he, born to be king of the Jews, they asked. Where is the promised kingdom now? Was it for this? Was it all for this? For thirty years we have been much as any family. Oh, life was hard, especially when dear Joseph died. But you were there, my son, to carry on the trade of carpenter. We were not rich, but never quite in want. And I was happy then, until three years ago. Is that all it is, just three? Some power beyond yourself came calling you. Though I had known that call was there ever since we found you with the teachers in the temple. I must be about my father's business, you said and you were up and gone. I realise now the change in our relationship occurred that day in Cana at the wedding feast. The wine ran out. Instinctive, instinctively I thought of you. Tell him, tell Jesus, he will know what's to be done. I see now I had come to depend on you, for you are always there. But that day when I said, the wine has failed, you looked at me in such a way as you had never looked before. Woman, you said, dear woman, why bring me into this? My hour has not yet come. I brushed it off as though it, I had not noticed the fundamental change. I ordered all the servants, do what he says. And yet I knew that things could never be the same again in our relationship. I suppose that every mother thinks her son, however tall he grows, is still her little boy. But it was more than that. Somehow you were no more mine than anyone's, for you belong to no one, yet to all. And when you said your time was not yet come, what time was that? Is this your time? Is this why you were born? Or has something gone terribly, horribly wrong? It was all right to start with. Why, with a mother's pride, I watched the crowds come eagerly to hear you speak and bring their stick. You even raised the dead. Huh, raised the dead? Why, then, are you hanging here? Is it only others you can raise? Why not yourself? I knew it would end like this. That was why I tried to stop you preaching. I hurt you then, but you hurt me when you asked, Who is my mother? Who my brothers? They are, you said, all those who hear God's word and put it into practice. Was I so wrong to try to spare you this? All down the years since that first day, when I was told I would become the mother of a son, I have hidden many things within my heart, which no one else could know or understand. I knew you would be different, 
and I've seen the signs of your authority as countless people came to you. I've watched and heard you teach deep things. You did not learn from Joseph or from me, from me. And all along I've heard, deep hidden in my mind, the voice of ancient Simeon, that day we took you to the temple to present you to the Lord. He took you from me in his arms and prophesied of you, then looked at me and said, A sword will pierce your own soul too. So this is it. This is the sword he meant. Yes, you were born for this. This is how it was meant to be. But it all seems such a waste, and certainly I do not understand. Ooh. Mm -hmm.
Now I stand here and watch, almost two thousand years away. It is not so very long ago. Things have not changed since then. Oh, outward things, the means of travel. By leaving now, before this day is out, I could be in Jerusalem. But deeper, more important, lasting things. The people that we are, the nursing of our hurts, our selfishness and pride, these have not changed at all. And so I stand with countless others down the years, around the cross, and watch and wait. We are so familiar with the cross, and wear it as an ornament. How strange! It is a sign of death, a means of getting rid of those society has rejected. For most of them, of course, the rejection was deserved. The thief who hung beside you, Lord, admitted that. We are punished justly, he exclaimed, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then the words which always have astonished me. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What was it, Lord, that enabled him to see from all his agony and watching you in yours, you were a king? If he had heard you preach or watched you heal, or had he seen you feed the multitude on five small loaves, I could have understood if he had followed them. What was there in your broken body, bloody pain, that enabled him to see your glory? He was so sure, and with his helpless cry he gained eternity. Tell me, Lord, and I hardly dare to ask this, what was it like? Oh, I do not mean the pain that racked your body. I do not even want to think of that. I don't believe I can. No, I am thinking of the shock and desolation when you were cut off from God. For that I cannot understand. I know too well what it is like to feel that I have cut myself from God by some deliberate sin, although I know he never has, in fact, deserted me. But you, who never sinned, and who enjoyed a unity and deep communion with him which was unique, and who never had experienced the slightest shadow on his love for you, you were indeed cut off cast into that darkness which surrounded you, and all the land while you hung there. That ghastly cry, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I know, Lord, I know why. I hardly dare to speak it out. I am ashamed, yet treasure it. You went through that for me. I stand here, with so many others, and yet I stand alone. Somehow there's only you upon your cross and me. I've hardly dared to raise my eyes, but now I do, and find you looking down at me. It hurts me, Lord, to hold your eyes with mine. I'd rather turn away. But if I am to know the wonder of this day, I must not turn too soon. I must wait in silence and in awe and hear you whisper through your parched and broken lips, I am doing this for you. I hurt because I want to cry, don't do it, Lord, for me. I don't deserve. I am not good enough. I do not feel for you the depth of love you have for me. It hurts me, Lord. It really hurts to know that you did that for me. I realize, Lord, of course, that it is not the same for me as it was for Peter, Mary, or the rest who gathered round the cross at Calvary. When you cried, It is finished, they must have thought you meant it was the end. They could not understand it was a shout of triumph. You had accomplished all the Father had set for you to do. So I cannot possibly enter their despair. 
For that I'm grateful, Lord. For I can go from here with a deep excitement in my heart. I know the end. Except there is no end, and never will be now. I leave anticipating Sunday, so I can only dimly comprehend, as though I watched some play, the feelings of those who loved you then. Their anguish as they saw your body taken down, wrapped in a winding sheet and carried to a grave they did not choose. They waited then in hopeless sorrow for the Sabbath day to end, that they might go to find your lifeless body. I wait for something totally different, but that's for Sunday, and I will not allow the wonder of that day to detract in any way from the wonder of this. Today, today, you hang there for me.